doing, all right? Doc, the Lord is blessing an old guy like me. I'm hanging in there, man. Okay. You count down? Yeah, we count down. 10 seconds. We, we know a prior, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> we are live. All right, man. We're live, guys. Let Jonathan do his welcome to everybody, and then we'll get started in just a very few moments. I will say initially glad to have all of our panelists back again tonight. I get forward for a great discussion in terms of social justice and the pandemic on tonight. I'm going to turn you over now to Brother Gibbons, who's going to facilitate for us tonight. As always, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad. And we want to welcome you all tonight um, to our third installment of our social justice town hall. We thank you so much uh, for tuning in <clears throat> on tonight here in the North Peoria Church of Christ Cyber Sanctuary. Listen, do me a favor as you're watching right now, take a moment and press that share button right at the bottom of your screen. Come on, I'm going to give you a moment uh, to press that share button at the bottom of the screen. We're going to have an awesome time tonight and dialogue and conversation, but I need you to press that share button. So I'm going to give everybody a moment to press that share button right now, right at the bottom of your screen. Right at the bottom of your screen, press that share button. And then if you're coming on in, we want you to say something. Come on, check in. Let us know where you are watching from. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know what city and state that you are watching from. We're so glad you decided to tune in with us again on tonight as we continue our dialogue to talk about the things that have been uh, affecting us um, as people, affecting us as a community of believers, and affecting us, most importantly, as African Americans in the Lord's Church. So again, Come on in, press that share button, check in with us. Let us, let us know where you're watching from um, and start a watch party. Do me a favor, start a watch party. Start a watch party right now so other people uh, can, can come on in and watch from wherever they are viewing this from. Uh, come on, just, just share it, share it. Start a watch party, check in, let us know where you're watching from. And we'll get started in just about 30 seconds. 30 seconds, we're gonna get started. Come on, let's get these views up. Come on, come on, everybody, come on in. We welcome you again. Uh, to our social justice forum on tonight. We have a great uh, group of panelists um, who will introduce themselves in just a moment uh, to you all, uh, right from around the country. A plethora, plethora of, of men and women of God here on tonight. To you all, uh, right from around the country. All right, and we're going to start with introductions. We'll start with Dr. Russell Pointer on tonight. Hey, I am uh, Dr. Russell A. Pointer from the Minneapolis Central Church of Christ and uh, glad to be on this panel again. Thankful to Dr. Warren for uh, uh, Blakeney for inviting me and to be with such a great cloud of witnesses, with lawyers and just great men of God and people and men and women of God. Thank God for that. Pastor Bowdry. Uh, good evening, I'm Daryl Bowdry pastor of the South Central Church of Christ in Tyler, Texas. Thank you also for, I really enjoyed being a, a participant last week and I anticipate a lively, lively discussion tonight. Dr. Matthews. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Cleavon Matthews, minister of the Bow Believers Church of Christ in Dayton, Ohio. Also a licensed professional counselor humbled by the invitation from Dr. Blakeney to be a part of this uh, panel discussion tonight. <clears throat> yes, thanks. Alvin L. Daniels Jr., a senior minister of the Hope uh, Church of Christ in Hollywood uh, slash Hollywood, uh, Florida. Uh, <laughs> thank you for again to be a part of this uh, panel. Thank you, Dr. Blakeney, for uh, setting this table and thank you for the seat at the table. Looking forward to the discussion. Pastor Brown. Jonathan, I don't mean to uh, try to be chivalrous, but if you could, could you allow our dear sister to go before I do? Of course, of course. It's Katrina Brown. I had my whole last but not least statement ready to roll. Uh, Katrina Brown, Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a practicing attorney here in the state. Awesome. And it's a state Awesome. All right, Brother Antoine Brown. 
Antoine Brown, uh, Minister of the Isaiah Drive Church of Christ here in Charleston, South Carolina. And let me say, go Braves. <laughs> and Dr. Blakeney. Dr. Warren Blakeney from the North Peoria Church. And we're glad to have all of you guys on tonight and welcome all of our audiences. Uh, whoever you are and wherever you are, we're glad to have you tonight as well. Uh, and of course, we have some other panelists. Jonathan will tell you that we have two of our female panelists that's traveling. So Jonathan, won't you let them know where they are? Yes, yeah, so we have um, Amber Baldwin and Dajanae Burnett, um, as well as Sister Debbie Houston. They're all traveling and did let me know. So we wanna make sure we pray for them as they're traveling right now, traveling grace for them uh, while they are out around the country. And so we're praying for them and hopefully prayerfully they'll be back on uh, on next week. So keep them in your prayers, all right? All righty, listen, we wanna get started with our questions on tonight. We wanna to interact with you all in the audience. So if you do have a question, make sure you leave that question uh, right uh, in our comments. Just put hashtag question so we can find it easy. Just put hashtag question and type your question out so we can address it. Or you can shoot that question to us via email, NorthPeoriaCLC at gmail.com. All right, here's our first question for tonight. Some say that this pandemic has explicated, exposed, and pushed many churches outside of their comfort zone in order to stay afloat in ministry. Uh, from a pastoral or constituent standpoint, wherever you fall on the spectrum, what methodologies have you seen shift in the church during the pandemic? Have they been successful? And should those changes have taken place pre-pandemic. Uh, let, let's start with, uh, on tonight, let's start with uh, Brother Antoine Brown. <laughs> um, so there has been a shift in methodologies. You know, I remember, and, and I'm, I'm only 43 and I'll be 44 on uh, Thursday. But I, I remember, you know, when, when we were growing up, there was a time when, you know, we spoke bad against tele-evangelist and you know you can't go to church through the tv and you you can't do this and and now all of a sudden we've had to shift that message because everybody going to church through the tv um and so we, we we've had to, to to shift um some things and um you know i'm i'm at a congregation that's a lot older uh as far as demographic and 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 coming in, I, I saw some things that we should have shifted to, um, and and I and we were we were talking about it. I was going to say we were preparing, but I, I, we there, honestly there was no true preparation. We were talking about it, and before we knew it, here comes the pandemic, which pushed us to move in a direction that we should have already been. We should not have had to scramble. Uh, to have this virtual presence, we should have already had this virtual presence, because you know if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. And I think we were in a in a mode where we had to get ready, so we were trying to play catch up. You know, thank God we had some people who were capable of bringing us there. Uh, but to answer your question, certainly it has made us change some of my, our methodologies. And if and if I could be honest, it challenged some of our theology. Okay, thank you, Brother Brown. Brother Bowdrey. Well, I want to. I want to first of all uh, second everything that brother that brother Brown said. Uh, carrying it a step further, and in answering your question, yes, these things should have happened pre-COVID. Uh, and I'll make the statement that for um, for progressive-minded churches and ministries, um, COVID could turn out to be a blessing. I think that for the church, this pandemic has caused us to rethink our relevance. And in a lot of ways that we thought we were relevant, we were just, we were blinded because we had the luxury of not believing the truth. For instance, we didn't want to believe that we were losing our young people, but we did. And they weren't giving up on religion. They were going to churches and religious organizations that spoke to their needs and that spoke to their lifestyle. 
And I don't, I don't mean that in a demeaning way. These churches were connected. We held on to an old model. Um, and as I always said, if you don't, uh, if you don't tell something uh, that what we do is just tradition, then in our minds, tradition then becomes truth, right? Because we, we never say anything. We never say anything different. Um, not only do we have to um, realize that our definition of church has to be broad, because all of us that are online are preaching to more people than we were preaching at, uh, preaching to a year ago, twice as many people three times as many people. And if, you, and if you use analytics, I mean, this COVID has given us an opportunity in the church to create more, use more gifts within the church and use our young people because this technology is the language that they speak. Uh, and we don't have, no longer have to wait till a child that grows up in the church is 43 years old before we consider him or her for any position of prominence or leadership. So I think I think we're playing on a completely different playing field. I'm glad to, I'm like the old prophet, Annas. I'm, I'm glad to see this day. Uh, I, I hate what brought it about, but the church has always thrived through persecution and plague, pestilence. So let's go with it. Sister Brown. You know, I, I love I love traditional church. I, I, I've got to say that. Um, I love being around the saints. I love being in the presence of the saints. I, I just love it. But I, I, I definitely concur with um, the need to kind of move forward um, in technology and exposure and allowing um, different people to be able to hear the gospel. And I think that this access is done. And I know for me, on a Sunday morning, I get up, I listen to Brother Orpheus because he's an hour ahead of me and I, I go listen to my church and I get down and listen to Brother Daniels. I done been to three cities in one day. So I'm excited about it. And I think for me, as somebody who loves the word, who loves to hear the word, it has just been, I've enjoyed, I'm like, Lord, you know, I, I don't want it to be extended too long, but I'm, I'm just having a good time. And I think for a lot of young people, we are so excited to be able to hear the word and hear it from a different perspective. And I think when Brother Browdry was talking about us losing the youth, I shook my head, not necessarily because we weren't technology inclined, um, but I think that sometimes the sermons that we hear sometimes aren't related to our lives. They aren't related to the things that we're, we're dealing with. I, I remember when I went to a married women's class one time and they were talking and, and no, no bash on these women, but they were talking about, you know, you want to keep your husband, you got to bake a cake, you got to know how to cook. And I was thinking about my granddaddy who cheated on my grandma, she's the best cook I ever known. I'm like, they ain't never kept a man. I, I like, like we need to be talking about stuff that people are actually dealing with. And so I think now in this pandemic, it has forced preachers to step their game up and to teach hope, to give out hope, to teach about the things that we need in this season. So I'm excited about it. Thank, thank you, Katrina. Thank you so much. Dr. Pointer. Yes, I, I think uh, everyone has uh, totally capitalized on what answered the question, but just to uh, continue the conversation, I think that it forced us to have an uncomfortable conversation. Um, I, even with my own self, uh, I had to look at, well, I like, I, I'm, a, I'm the last of the baby boom, last year the baby boom. So I, I like having the guys walk down the aisle with the communion trays and watching the communion trays packed up, stacked up and I enjoyed passing it out. I enjoyed watching it and, and taking the cup and watching everybody crush the bread up. I, I enjoyed all of that. I grew up under that era. And uh, even before that era was ended, uh, I knew that God has been speaking to me dealing with this thing. And so we were kind of, I, I got some things in place pre-COVID. So when COVID actually hit, I was ready for it. We had already gone to online giving. We had already taken, even though I, I fought, the longest thing I fought was the community because I like seeing my men come down the aisle. I, am, you know, and, and so I got rid of that and then we went to the packet beforehand. So when all of, when, when COVID hit, we were already prepared for, God had already prepared us for everything that was going to take place almost. So it was really uh, prophetically, not only that, but God allowed us to not just talk about church, but actually be the church now. And that's why we started our feeding program. 
That's why we have an uh, online presence, not just uh, 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 viscerally, but virtually. So you have two different audiences. You got the, the, the visceral audience uh, and you got the virtual audience. You got the visceral, those that are right there. I got my little crew that I got my central crew. And then I got those that are online watching. So I think it's very important. And when it comes to what, what uh, the, the attorney said earlier, uh, and I appreciate what she had to say, was that you're right. You can go to three different cities. I can hear all you guys preach and go to be your favorite preacher. You got people who like to hear you preach, so they come to your service. Um, and it's not so much that, that, that so much, but like you said, it goes back to realness and relevance. And it goes back to what Paul was talking about in Second, First Corinthians 3, where Paul said, I want to come and talk to you about heavier matters, but I can't because you're still on first principles. And so a lot of preachers are still on first principles while there are some Amen. members that do want to grow and be taught some of the heavier, the media matters. And, and you can't teach the media matter because you choke on it because you're still hung up, hanging out whether someone can do this, that, or the other in church service. So you, you're losing your spirit. You, you're immature. You're not even ready for, for growth. And so, yes, that helped our church tremendously by pushing us out there because it made us to swim. I remember growing up, in order to get, eat lunch, we had to, we had to jump up and high dive in Florida, in Tampa, by the way. Whoever was in time and and uh, Alvin Daniels, uh, we had to jump up a high dive in Tampa, and to get lunch or dinner, we had to jump off. If you didn't, you couldn't eat that night. So guess who the best swimmer was? I jumped. I was shaking. They got films of me shaking. I'm doing. I'm like this. I gotta jump. I gotta. Yeah, but I had to eat. A brother gotta eat. You know. So I had to jump off the high dive. But I learned to eat and I learned to swim. So I think that same way everybody said we all had to jump out here. And if you don't take the shift, the paradigm shift, you're gonna miss it. You gotta understand. Church has changed virtual and visceral and uh i'll come back later i wanted to stop on that so others can have a chance to not say what thank you that, that was that was good dr point anybody else want to weigh in on that uh weigh in on that thought about how uh, this season has affected churches uh, there was a question in the comments that was asked uh, pertaining to this has COVID 19 had a positive or not so positive impact on baptisms Anybody want to wait? Uh, Alvin Daniels, can you weigh in on that, sir? Uh, Brother Jonathan, um, uh, in, in our case, uh, in terms of the sheer numbers, our expectation, the number of our typical expectation by this time would have been uh, far greater uh, than it is. We've had um, some baptisms. Uh, but not to the degree that a, you know, a, a meeting church uh, would have had, at, you know, by this time. Um, and I think baptisms, and I can't speak for everybody, uh, would, would be a little bit more difficult now because, you know, it's kind of like you're chasing the baptism instead of a person walking down the aisle and the atmospherics that contribute to that dynamic uh, taking place, they're simply not there. And so the center who desires baptism have to be determined about that baptism and the church that's connecting online with uh, those uh, potential converts have to be very intentional as well. So long story short, yes, it has impacted in a negative way. Let's not call it negative. The numbers and expectations uh, are not uh, what they would normally be. Brother, brother, uh, Jonathan, can I get brother, uh, Dr. Orpheus Haywood, technology has been tremendous with him. Uh, he has facilitated some things for so many of us in the church. When you go to the Renaissance Church, it is uniquely prepared for this era and this time. Uh, and I would say that he and, and Rodney Doolin, Dr. Doolin, and Dr. Paul Day uh, helped me move forward long before the pandemic hit. Uh, they came to me one day and say, Pop, do you know how much money you're missing because millennials don't carry cash? I said, don't. <laughs> they don't carry cash. He said, you're missing money. I said, really? He said, yeah, Pop, get one of those card swipes and get some money. I said, I don't know about that. And I messed around and got the card swipe and my offering went up $2,000 because millennials don't carry cash. So at that point, I went to everything else from Stripe to card swipe to everything else because I discovered that you have to understand the culture. And so I got with young men who helped me, including Dr. Haywood, understand this culture. That's why I'm not afraid of dealing with young men 
and young women because they bless your life. Uh, you bring them around you and you learn. I learned how, you know, no cap. I didn't know what no cap was. All right. What the heck is no cap? I mean, I think a capital letter. So, so uh, I'm, I'm around young people because we've got to turn the church over to someone. We've got to leave this church to somebody. And those guys who are my age are so set in their ways until we can't move them. We can't move the needle. And I'm speaking to those of you who are older preachers who are listening. It's time you understand that culture is changing. Word of God doesn't change. We've got to understand the culture in which we find ourselves and try to address the needs of these young people. And if we don't, we're going to continue. When we go back in church, we're going to continue to lose young people if we don't make the word relevant to the needs of this culture that we're dealing with. Dr. David, can you can you say something to us? Sure, I appreciate that, uh, Pop. I really thank God for your guidance and faith in this time. Um, I think this this period of time has, has been a uh, a moment where God has moved the church from a from a local focus to a global focus. Um, I think that's been a real big shift for us. Is that. Um, we were just, we, we were getting a handle on the local growth. And then suddenly God shifted the church into a global platform that required us to have to rethink our whole uh, philosophy of ministry. And so um, I think if there's anything that I've learned in this pandemic was that there were some things that didn't matter to God and there's some things that really matter to God. Um, and so I think what God did was he pushed us back into a people business and shut down a building business. Yeah. I think a lot of us had was so building focused that the pinnacle of your ministry was whether you built a facility and God has suspended that, that trophy and shut the doors and said, now I'm forcing you to where the harvest is. And the harvest is online with uh, 6.8 billion people that we have not taken advantage of. And now God forced us. It, 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 it wasn't even like God asked us to find the harvest. He pushed us into the harvest. And, um, and now it makes us have to rethink ministry. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge I've, I, have, I have felt is that I think that I was doing okay locally. Um, but I think the Lord forced me to have to look at ministry beyond the local church and into the global platform. The other thing that it did was that it made me have to rethink evangelistic methodology. So as many have indicated, um, evangelistic methodology was heavily person to person. So what we had to do was create third party material that could be shared online by our members and we had to give them um, we had to give them material that they could use in Zoom, material that they could use on Facebook Live, material that they could use that was electronic. And so we had to literally train the church how to do evangelism a different way using third-party online material, which was a shift. Um, but then, you know, when I realized that I was like, man, the church has been really behind because every other product has been sold in that way online. It's, and the way they advertise their product, um, it, it's clear that the church has been behind. So now evangelism has had to take on a different kind of methodology. With baptisms, um, we have consistently baptized, but not to the number that we once baptized. So it's been consistent, but uh, the methodology is different. I think Alvin mentioned, you know, you we have the benefit of the atmosphere. Now I find myself in my invitation saying, now, if you want to, if you want to be saved, make sure you email us or make sure you call the number on your screen. If you call that number right now, we will be, we're ready to respond. And that back in the day, we'd say, don't you let the devil hold you in that seat. Come down <laughs> like the, the whole verbiage had to change. <laughs> so now we have to say, no, man, right now, call that number right now, pick up your cell phone, send us an email, you know, and, and so we would press that and we, we, we have to wait for emails and phone calls to come in. So we have a staff that waits several hours after the message, just in case a person wants to be saved. So the methodologies have shifted. That's my contribution is, is really think about ministry in a virtual world 
will completely metamorphosize your methodology. And I can speak more to that, but would love to uh, hear, hear others on that. Well, that, was, that was good, Dr. Hayward. That was good. Let, let's transition to our uh, next question. Growing up, many leaders and patrons of the church uh, would argue that when you are dealing with issues such as mental health, all you need to do is take it to Jesus and pray that things will get better. But as the climate of mental health has shifted, uh, many theologians and scholars believe that it is now okay to have Jesus and a therapist. Oh, you're right. What are your thoughts? Can, can, I, can I start with Dr. Cleveland Matthews? Can you uh, give us your background as well, sir? I, yeah, I'm a minister and a licensed professional counselor, uh, also a registered nurse here in the state of Ohio. Um, I've had experience at uh, Lebanon Correctional uh, Center, also uh, Samaritan Behavioral Center, which is a treatment center for uh, alcoholism and addiction. Uh, I have some experience in private practice and I currently am a military family life counselor for uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, Mental, mental health, um, in, in the simplest way that I can put it, is the same thing as physical health. You see a doctor uh, for um, your mental health, for your, uh, you have a cardiologist, you have a uh, uh, pulmonologist, um, you, you see a doctor, uh, they may prescribe medication, they may uh, recommend uh, some type of physical therapy. They may uh, recommend a specialist, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, there, there's quite a bit of stigma and continues to be uh, stigma as it relates to mental health. Uh, but mental health is real. It, it exists in our churches. It existed before COVID. Uh, there are people sitting uh, in most of our churches who uh, according to DSM-5 uh, st statistical manual would fit the category of diagnosable mental health disorders. Um, there's controversy around things like autism and ADHD, uh, but they're real. Um, addiction is real. Um, bipolar disorder, um, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorders. Uh, a lot of times those people have been in our church and they're usually a problem. And we think that it may just be a, you know, they're just being uh, a difficult person when in fact that person uh, may, may have in fact a mental health disorder uh, that has not been diagnosed and is not being treated. Uh, I think that every, everybody who pastors a church, everybody who's involved uh, in ministry ought to uh, have some type of mental health uh, counselor or therapist uh, to help uh, process uh, some of the things that we experience, uh, just to be able to be in a confidential sit setting uh, and unwind and, and get some things off of our chest. Uh, God created counselors. God gave, uh, scripture talks about the wisdom uh, of counselors. We can read in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, Jesus, was, uh, one of the titles is wonderful counselor. So uh, counsel, counseling is not uh, antithetical to, uh, to theology or to the Christian life. It is a wonderful uh, gift that God has given us and more of us need to take advantage of it, especially in times like COVID when folks are experiencing more isolation, more, uh, more depression, more anxiety uh, because <clears throat> they're uncertain about employment, they're concerned uh, about family members uh, who some may be elderly and they're in nursing homes, uh, they can't visit them, uh, they can only see them through a door or a window. 
And uh, you have parents now who are uh, having to, uh, to work and to find out how to make a way to uh, homeschool their children. So it, it's a very stressful time for a lot of people and uh, we, we need resources. We need mental health resources, not to mention uh, September was Suicide Awareness Month. Uh, this month, the month of October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and, and these things happen in our churches. Uh, we, we know this. We, uh, there have been occasions where uh, members have been killed uh, right, at, right on the grounds of the church. Uh, domestic violence, suicide. Uh, Christians, uh, some have committed suicide. We've heard of people in ministry who have committed suicide. So uh, there is a lot of work to do in, in terms of mental health. Um, and <clears throat> we have to find ways to, to, uh, to remain sane uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to this. I'm, platforms like this um, give, give us an opportunity to, uh, to connect with each other in terms of brotherhood, in terms of fraternity, uh, in ways that are so critical and important. Uh, we're going through this together. We're learning this together. Uh, and it's, it's comforting to know and encouraging to know that you're not alone. And, and so, so many of our members uh, are feeling alone. Uh, the highlight of, of most of their uh, week was coming to church on Sunday and being able to, uh, to see their, their church family. And they can't do that anymore. They, they miss those hugs. They miss those uh, uh, foyer four and parking lot conversations. So, uh, th there's a lot of things that we can do that God has gifted us to do. Uh, certainly prayer uh, is something that we ought to always be engaged in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in in times like this and, and before and after as well. But there are some things you just can't pray away. Um, there, you know, faith without works is dead. So uh, some of the things that we, we do uh, and we can do is I, I just posted yesterday uh, a gratitude check. Um, you know, post something that you're grateful for, just one thing you're grateful for um, and keep a gratitude journal. Um, I often challenge people uh, to, uh, to write, write down in a journal uh, 100 things that you're grateful for. Uh, the first 10 or 15, it'd be kind of easy. Uh, then you start, you keep going and you, you begin to see the depth of just how much you have to be grateful for. And, and hate, hatefulness and, and gratefulness don't go together. So one way you drive out hatred, one, one way you drive out uh, depression and sadness and grief is by being grateful. And you don't just get grateful, you have to work at it. So that's a, a technique or a skill that you can use to help build gratitude. Uh, finding ways to get out. Uh, I went and played golf today. Um, get being out and feeling the wind on my face seeing the trees, looking at the squirrels, uh, you know, walk, walking the ground, uh, that, that helps to balance, that helps to, to purge and clear the mind. Um, you know, being active, find, even if it's in the house, doing push-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks, whatever, something to keep the blood circulating and, and moving because the mind and the body go, go together. <laughs> Uh, eating healthy meals, drinking plenty of water, good sleep hygiene, um, you know, uh, making sure that you're getting quality sleep. Um, th those types of things help with your mental health. Uh, but if you have something that's more advanced, 
uh, you have a diagnosable uh, mental health disorder, then certainly you need uh, therapy. Some people uh, benefit from uh, medication. Sometimes it's long-term, sometimes it's just a short, uh, short period of time. But uh, remaining positive and being positive sometimes is a matter of perspective. Um, you know, I, I say the serenity prayer every day, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can and wisdom to know the difference. We can't change COVID. Uh, we, all we can do with COVID is accept it. Uh, we, we've got to accept uh, this, this new reality. We've got to accept uh, this, this virtual church. We, we've got to accept it. And so we can either be miserable and angry and allow it to bring us down, or we can change our perspective. And like many of you have said today, uh, the positive things that are coming out of this, that uh, in many ways we can continue when this is over and it'll be all for the glory of God. Uh, not sure if I've answered the question, but I could go on and on. I'll just pause right there. Can I, can I get you, and I'll give three back to Jonathan. Next week, uh, we want you to come back. And some of those things you suggested, we'll put in writing so that folks will be able to have it if they didn't get it written down. Uh, all the suggestions that you had, because I've been asked one of the reasons why I did this, because folks are depressed. They got a lot of anxiety, unemployment. I mean, you, if I go visit my mother and dad, am I going to take COVID to them because their age? A lot of anxiety during this season. And you helped us uh, as preachers on our call deal with our anxiety and all the things that we deal with leading a church. And I want to say this, so many times people who are out there don't realize the pressure that men of God are facing uh, as we lead through a pandemic. It's very different for us. <laughs> and we have the stress of all of you on our shoulders, not just our families, but all of you are on our shoulders. And so you can become critical. You can say things that really are very hurtful, but we've never led through a pandemic. And so the mental disposition we have is that a lot of us need help as well. And the last folk to seek mental help are Black folk. <laughs> we, we're the last ones to go. We don't like dealing with that. So that's one of the reasons why we asked uh, Dr. Matthews to come on tonight, because I believe a lot of us need what he's been sharing. So thank you again for being with us. He'll be back next week if the Lord said the same. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Matthews. You, you definitely blessed us. Um, you know, I, I wrote some things down, so that was good. I want to lead into our next question, which kind of is, is kind of attached to this one. Uh, but uh, we'll start with Katrina. How, how has mental health uh, affected your house during this pandemic? Um, what have you done to deal with, um, you know, your mental health in this season? Well, let me just say, I definitely think you can have Jesus and a therapist. I believe fully in that. Um, when I started practicing, it's one thing about being, I love my people, but when I'm around um, some of my white friends, I remember I had a girl that I worked with when I was at a big firm. And on Thursdays at 10, I don't care what we had going on, sis was gone. And, I, and I one day I went, I said, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, you go working out, you're doing yoga. She said, no, I have a, a therapist, a standing step therapist appointment every week. And I said, well, are you and your husband having some issues? Like, she was like, girl, no, nothing's wrong. I just need somebody to talk to. And I thought, why? She was like, it's just nice to have a voice that doesn't have any skin in the game that just listens. And I thought to myself, like, as a Black woman, like, how how much of a relief that would if you just had somebody who didn't have a dog in the fight, but that just listened to what you had to say. I think just as culturally speaking, there's so much shame when people talk about having anxiety or if they say that they are, they have something going on. Um, we tend to always say, girl, just, you know, pray about it. And, and you do need to pray. But, you know, when you get off your knees, you need to find your therapist. And if you're on medication, take your medication for us here. Um, I know for me, I still see my therapist. We, I don't see her every Thursday because I can't afford to like my home girl can, but um, I see her very regularly. And also, you know, for me, I enjoy, I, I study my Bible. I talk, there are men of God who I love and who I've trusted since my father has passed away, who, who ministered to me. And so I reach out, but I also think that one of the things we have to do as a church, and I know you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to say it anyway. 
um, is that we have to create an environment where we allow people to be honest about how they're feeling. Because sometimes we ask, but we really don't want to know. And so now uh, what should be a place where we can be honest about the things that we're going through, the things that we feel without judgment, has now become a place where people have to put on facades and are not able to really say honestly how they feel. And so when we, and, and I love that we, we're kind of, in some places, we're getting to a place now where people are talking about the issues and people are being honest and people, and, and it's like I say this all the time, the church is a hospital. And one of the things that we know is that we know how to point out what the issue is. We know how to diagnose a person, like you got this issue, you got this issue. But what we aren't doing is writing prescriptions to teach people how to deal and cope with what they're going through or how to be healed in the first place. And so when we get back to that perspective, along with having a therapist and seeking uh, the help that you need, I think we'll be able to help people. And also I think we have to know, um, there are some things I can talk to my minister about. There are some things where I need professional help. And I think that ministers have to know when they're outside of their capacity. That's like, if you come asking me about medical treatment, I'm outside of my capacity. Even if I've had the surgery, I couldn't tell you what they did. And so I think sometimes we just have to own up when we're outside of our capacity and we need to refer uh, people to those uh, professionals. And let me say this to people of God who are professionals. Brother Daniel said this a couple of uh, years ago when he was teaching, he said, if everybody in the church was operating on the gift, we would lack nothing. There is no excuse for people in the church not to have wheels when we got all these attorneys sitting up in here. There's no reason why we don't have people getting counsel. We got counselors that go to our church. We need to use the resources. So yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's, that's my answer. That was good. Dr. Corner, I see you have your hand up, sir. I wanted to say that um, real quickly that I wanted to make an appeal um, to all of our black men, our, our preachers in particular, there's nothing wrong with getting therapy. Um, I needed therapy before COVID. So I sure need it now. Because what COVID did, it traumatized trauma. There's a thing called trauma. And what COVID did was threw up America into trauma. And so a lot of us are gonna have to, I, I'm a firm believer that the uh, the clergy and the clinician are going to have to marry each other so they would be, because they should be healthy. Because the point we want to make is we need to be healthy. And I want to say that because a lot of times we want to talk about everybody going to counseling. And I appreciate the attorney, uh, Sister Brown, was very real and honest. But I'm telling you, as a black male, we need to be honest about therapy. Um, I, I, like, I, I like my favorite show is uh, Lean On Me. And I got several parts, but there's one part where you all know he came in to clean up the school and then uh, that young man came in and threw the desk on, on him. And he says uh, that she walks in the office and said, oh my God, Mr. Clark, nobody knows what you're doing. And he made a phrase, exactly. I like it like that. And sometimes we think we got God figured out. And what God did was dump the whole world in shambles. And guess what? God likes it like that. No one has the answer. We can sit right here and talk about this all day long. No preacher has a blueprint as to what God is going to do next. We all have to have faith. We all have to go get counseling. And we all have to marry the clinician. And as like I told you earlier, and the clergy or the preacher are going to have to marry. We're going to need each other. Because what happens is I need you to clear my mind during the week. But I need hope on the Lord's Day. And I just want to marry those two together. Um, and again, trauma, we've been traumatized. And so we need to be at least healthy. If nothing else, at least become, I wanna encourage our black men, especially, not that women aren't important, but our black men, please be healthy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. you, you want if you're listening and you need to have some help why don't you email us and we know somebody in your area or uh, we will find somebody in your area that you need help. It's, it's talking, we get through talking. The question is, how can I get the help? So we wanna be a resource for you uh, so that if someone is in your area who can provide that help for you, we have clinicians in places all across the country uh, and some of them on a sliding scale, you don't have to have a lot of money, but you can certainly get the help that you need. So just email us. Uh, I'm sure that if you were to email Dr. Matthews, uh, he would be a, uh, able to help you as well. Uh, Dr. Murray, who's in Oklahoma City, uh, who wasn't able to be with us tonight as another clinician. Uh, we will find somebody to help you with your anxiety, with your difficulty, because this is what this is all about, is trying to be helpful 
to those who are listening. That's good. And our email, if you want to email us, we'll connect you with somebody in your state. You can email us at northpeoriacoc at gmail.com and we'll get you connected with somebody. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. You don't have to tell us your personal business. Just tell us you need to get connected to somebody. Shoot us an email. Let us know what state, what city you're in, and we'll do our best to get you connected with a licensed counselor and therapist in your city. Okay. Any, any others want to weigh in on that before I continue to our next question? If I could, Jonathan. Um, I feel like we, we owe uh, Dr. Matthews uh, his uh, consulting fee, counseling fee. Hey, Amen. I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Matthews. Um, I would just add that, you know, I've had some personal experiences uh, that is one of the first ministerial assignments I had when I came to uh, Miami it was a uh, probably 17, 17 year old man, a young man that was um, threatening suicide, locked himself up in a room, had a pistol, family called me and I kind of sprung into action. Um, last month, September, September, I had a uh, nephew, my sister's son, 26 committed suicide. And um, like, like, like for me, uh, it, it's not theoretic. And I tried to kind of um, take an introspective look at myself to see if I was being the kind of counselor that I needed to be as a, as a preacher, as a man of God. And what I try to do as a mantra is incorporate uh, some level of psychology in, in my preaching because I see the, the Bible as a book of theology, but it's also a book of uh, psychology, uh, the mind, the mind be renewed in the spirit of your mind as a man thinketh in his heart. It's all over uh, the scripture. So I, I would just add that from a, a, a preaching standpoint, I think sometimes we have to revisit how we preach. That is, we, we preach to broken people, bruised, pre, bruised people. And sometimes we take the bruised people and we go ahead and, and break them. Um, and I think somewhere in the scripture, Jesus said a bruised reed, he would not break and a uh, smoldering flax, he would not snuff out. In other words, they already come into us broken and we tend to teach and preach a theology that further, I'm not saying don't teach truth, I'm not saying that. We teach and preach in such a way that we leverage even more pressure on people that are already broken. In other words, we'll, we'll send them to hell through our preaching and our teaching. And they saying, you know, preach, I just came out of there. You know what I mean? I didn't come, I came for something else. So we have to find a balance in our preaching and our teaching. I think it's Jeremiah 8. There were two questions, not one, two questions, not one. The one question is, um, is there not any bomb in Gilead? That was number one. Then number two, are there any physicians there? Even if you have the bomb, you got to have somebody that knows how to apply uh, the bomb. And I think we have to revisit how we preach, how we teach, our transparency and us really meeting people uh, in their desperate need, their psychological need with the scriptures that we know, you know, all too well. That's my little piece I wanted to add. Jonathan, if, if I could, and, and, and I see Dr. Awood has his hand up, um, as it relates to the stigma, um, I, I don't know if a lot of people know, you know, I used to be ashamed of the fact that, you know, when I came out of Iraq, I was, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and I, and I kind of hid that a lot because there was a stigma attached to people that had PTSD because you only heard the horror stories um, of how these soldiers are coming out of combat and they're, they're, they're doing these different things. But I had to get to a point where I realized that if I did not seek <clears throat> that if I did not seek the proper counseling for my PTSD, then I would be one of those stories. Either I would be the story of the person that was shooting up places, or I would be the story of the person um, that, was, that had committed suicide. And so it was when I figured out that in order for me not to be a part of the, the stigma, then I had to get the treatment that was necessary. And so, um, you know, as I, you know, got more into ministry, 
and especially here at Isaiah Drive, one of the things that I, I made very clear was we were going to make our church a place of no shame, a place where you could come in and be transparent and be honest about the fact that you need help. If you were struggling with you know, if, if, if you're struggling with your sexuality, if you were, if there was a woman that was being abused at her home, if there were children that were dealing with sexual abuse at home, you could come in and we were, we were not going to just tell you to pray. I had to change our language from we'll pray for you to the, to let's pray. And then we're going to get you some help because this is what I know. I don't know anything about I, I I take therapy, but I don't I don't know it, and I don't even play a therapist on television. So I had to realize that there is a limit to what I can do, and so um, I, I I had to ensure that they knew that there was a bit of transparency. It's still hard for some of us, but I think when I'm open about my diagnosis of post traumatic stress disorder, it allows them to let their guard down, and they can be open about their traumas and their problems. And so I, I think we have to get to that place. And the last thing I want to say is, if there is somebody, and and, and I've talked to uh, Dr. Matthews before. And, and, and I offered this to somebody else and he gave me a range of his price. But if there's anybody that's in the comments that want to uh, have an hour of therapy, I would be willing to foot the bill of that first hour and, and I'll take care of that for you. Wow, wow. I hope y'all heard that. I hope you heard that. Wow. <laughs> uh, uh, Antoine, uh, Dr. Your phone number. Um, Antoine, make sure you, you call me immediately so I can make good on your promise. And, uh, and get, get that. Um, <laughs> I just, I wanted, I wanted to say to uh, men of God and to churches, um, you know, don't ignore the symptoms of anxiety and stress because it can get to a place where when it hits, um, it will almost seem unmanageable. And you, you really have to be honest enough to admit the need for, for, uh, for help. And um, I'm all too familiar with the realities of anxiety. And when it hit me, I had ignored it for so many years that um, by the time it hit, um, it had hit like a ton of bricks. And it, um, I can remember vividly when, when I had my first bout with anxiety, or my first, um, I would say my first acknowledged bout with anxiety. Um, I, was in, I was in a gospel meeting and uh, I can remember uh, I had so much pressure from so many different places. Uh, people who had a variety of expectations about me and what I should be doing and what I should be preaching. And, you know, you, you, you're, you're climbing what they call the proverbial ladder and everybody's shooting at you and you have all of these expectations and you don't know how to deal with that. And you worry about who you're pleasing and whether or not you're meeting everyone's expectation. And before you know it, you crash and you, you're trying to manage what looks like your success while at the, time, time, at the same time hiding your failures and you're trying to manage failure and success in the same breath, and and you'll find quickly, man, that um, it, it'll it'll crash. And so, men of God, I would hope that you would be honest enough to to admit the real pressure of ministry, and know that everybody doesn't take the time to check your pulse. And sometimes we would want the people of God and those we work with to check our pulse, but sometimes everybody don't check our pulse. And so when I went through my anxiety and didn't know what it was, the first person I called was Cleavon Matthews. I was in Jackson, Mississippi. And the only reason I knew to call Cleavon was because Cleavon was brave enough to share with me his own battles. And so when it hit me, the first name that came to my mind was Cleavon. And, and when I called, I don't know if you remember that Cleavon in Brook, I was in Brookhaven, Mississippi. And I called and my blood pressure shot up. I had sharp pains in my body. I was shaking. I was disconnected from anything that felt like emotion. 
Uh, usually I'm excited to go home. I think about my son. I didn't feel like I loved my son, didn't feel like I loved my daughter, didn't, wasn't excited to see my wife. I felt like an empty shell floating in an empty space. Uh, and I didn't know what to do. And I called Cleavon and, and, and got some advice to try to at least calm down till I could get home. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the best of us will have that battle. And it is better to be honest with it so you can address it because camouflaging it is, is ultimately unhealthy and you won't be of any good to anybody trying to fight it on your own. I want to, I want to thank you. Before we turn you back to Jonathan in a moment, thank you guys for your transparency. Brother Antoine, thank you for your offer, uh, for what you did. Listen, as we close out this aspect, and Jonathan will say some things about it. For men of God, one of the reasons why we brought Dr. Matthews on is not only for our public, but for our preachers as well. Uh, this COVID, I buried a seven-year-old boy that was born uh, and bred right here. Went to the hospital down in Memphis, treated for cancer. And I stood over his remains and buried that little boy. Uh, I've buried so many of close members to me in 24 years, 25 years, who supported and loved me through all of the stuff that we've been through, through the death of my wife. And so I know we just press it down and press it down, but every once in a while, if you're not careful, it'll run over. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thankful for the transparency because we need somebody to talk to. We gonna need somebody somewhere in life that's confidential, trained, uh, that can help us with our difficulty. And so we again, thank all these guys who are here. Uh, Daryl, you have some, some people who are trained, licensed clinicians. You wanna give that, and I think Jonathan's gonna close us out on this part. Um, I appreciate what everybody has had to offer uh, on, on tonight. And I think that, again, we can't be afraid nor hesitant. I think that one of the functions of the church is to be a referral service. We will never excel in all things, but thank God we have uh, people with legal minds like Sister Brown uh, in, in our churches. We have other medical professionals that we can consult. And, and, and I might add that you know and I know that all of us at any given time are just a centimeter away from crazy. And uh, there have always been crazy folk in the church. And, and shame on us that we have not recognized and be a, been able to treat them. I remember I was a 20, 21 year old preacher in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, a cousin of mine, his wife had had a, had had a mental breakdown. And I went to the mental ward of the hospital in Cleveland uh, to visit her and the moment she saw me she had a terrible meltdown and her doctors and the psychologists began to ask who who are you who you know i told her i'm a family member but they said no well but but who are you to her and when i told them that i was her preacher um that they said well goodness you need to tell us and get permission from us when you're going to visit her because her problem is closely aligned to religion. And every time she sees you, she considers herself a failure. It bruised my little ego at first until I truly understood what he was saying. And then let me say that at one time, I have not checked the statistics as of late but at one time in the state of Texas, I don't know who commissioned the survey, uh, but they took a survey of the mental hospitals in the state of Texas. And percentage wise, there were more members, no lie, there were more members, I ain't making this stuff up. There were more members of the Church of Christ than any other religious group. Why is that? And I think a lot of it has to do um, with what Brother Alvin was talking about and, and even what Orpheus was, was saying about the way that we present the love of God. 
and the way that we show it um, and the way that and the way that we judge we weren't many times our, our, our methods of preaching were are not helping people but they're hurting them and they're hurting their families so we have to be open and we have to be receptive um, to, to how we present the gospel and, and the love of God. And again, God knew COVID was coming and he knew everything that COVID would bring and he knew the changes that his people would have to go through. And uh, I'm just anxious to see his divine design. I want to say uh, thank you to all of our panelists on tonight. Um, I don't know about, about you, but I've been extremely blessed by all of your contributions uh, and this discussion. As, as I'm reading the comments and looking towards uh, those who are commenting, they all say, thank you so much. You poured into, each of you have poured into over 106 people on tonight who have been blessed by the resources, by the conversation. Uh, and just by your thoughts. Um, so take, take a moment and when you have after this is over, go back and read the comments. You blessed a lot of people uh, on tonight. Listen, uh, we wanna invite you back for next week and, and we'll start next week with this question and those who are watching in the audience, you can weigh in on this question and send your answer in as well. Uh, but the question that we're gonna start with on next Sunday night is this, uh, when the Black Lives Matter movement came into fruition, some argue uh, saying that uh, when people said Black Lives Matter, it was a racist statement excluding all other races and began to counterattack Black Lives Matter by saying all lives matter. And so the, the question is, what's your take on Black Lives Matter versus all lives matter? And we're going to start that discussion on next Sunday night. So if you want to weigh in on that, you can send that in. Uh, you can send us your answer to our email, NorthPeoriaCLC at gmail.com, or you can send us uh, a DM or leave your answer right in the comments, uh, and we'll we'll bring that up on next week. Again, I say thank you so much, on, and Dr. Blakey will close us out. Yeah, I want to make sure that those who are listening, go vote. Go vote. One of the things we're doing with this, go vote. Vote as if your life depended on it, because your life may well depend on it. Go vote. I always want to leave between now and November 3rd, with that in your consciousness, that in your heart. If you've not voted yet, get up and prepare, get your ballots together, look at them, make sure who you're voting for. But I want you to be, the last words of this particular group of folk is exercise your constitutional right, get up and go cast your vote because we're gonna need to vote to make things happen. And if you don't vote, then don't complain. All right, thank you for being with us on tonight. And just with that being said, for those of you who are watching in Tulsa County, our early voting starts Thursday, October 29th. Thursday, October 29th, it'll be at the Oniak Field, 201 North Elgin Avenue, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Make sure you get out and vote. Make sure you get out and vote. That's all I have on this evening. Govern yourselves accordingly. Let's pray out. Gracious and most heavenly Father, again, before we ask you for anything, we say thank you for everything. Thank you for this fruitful conversation with men and women of God. Continue to bless us in our respective places. God bless our mental health in this season. God, we know it's okay to have you and a counselor. Continue to keep us, God, in our personal ministries. And, and what we'll do is we'll be careful to give your name, praise, glory, and honor. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice, whatever they stand in need of, God. Stop by their house, throw your weight around, do what only you can do. And we'll be careful to give your name, praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody write in the comments, amen. Thank you, man.